and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ, and as you can see, I am sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Through Faith t-shirt on, my Gospel of John movie right next to me, and judging by the frame around me, we are back, taking down another atheist. Today on the chopping block is Deconstruction Zone, and his video, 35 Reasons Christianity is a Cult and Jesus Was a Cult Leader. The subtitle to this video is, Is Your Church a Cult? Um, this video... Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Mr. Deconstruction Zone over here was a Catholic originally, okay? We'll get into that as we get further into his 35 points. There's actually like 37 because he does number 8 twice, um, and then he goes from number 8, so there's actually like 36 reasons, and then he gives a bonus reason at the, at the end. So here's what we're going to do, okay? Um, we're going to take these in chunks of about five. Um, so for this video, I'm hoping that I can get through probably the first 15 to 20. Um, mostly because um, the, the thing is I've written all of these points down. Okay, I, I've, I've written all of these points down because what I'm going to do is I'm going to let him kind of talk. And I'm gonna, he's going to do about five points. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. And then I'm going to, like, go in and address each one. A lot of these are spurious claims that I don't know where he's getting these from. Um, a lot of these are claims based on, you know, like, modern day cults. And one of the things that we're going to do, before we jump into the video, I'm going to let him do his introduction. And then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to talk about a real life cult leader, okay? And then we'll get into his first five points, and then we'll start from there. Okay, so let's let him roll his intro here, and then we'll get into this. In the Gospels, Jesus is an apocalyptic doomsday prophet of the end of the world, a Jewish fundamentalist, an extremist, and what we would nowadays call a cult leader. At the time of Jesus, there were several self-proclaimed messiahs, all attempting to gain followers and forming their own messiah-based cults. These messiah figures were extremely charismatic and probably almost hypnotic in their appeal to the uneducated people, the poor peasants of that time. Let's think about what we would consider to be cults in our time and their characteristics. If we look closely, early Christianity had all of the hallmark features of a cult. Let's take a look. Okay. So that's his introduction. Um, all right. So, how would you define a cult leader? Several Christians would say that today, in Christianity, okay, within the sphere of Christianity, we have two major cult, actual cults, okay, that some consider to be denominations, others consider to be on the fringes. But basically, if you look at it, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are tantamount to cults, okay? The Mormons have their Book of Mormon, the Jehovah's Witnesses have their Watchtower and their New World Translation that they believe fix the scriptures, okay? Both of them use very cult-like tactics to keep their people mentally enslaved. I don't doubt that, okay? Both claim that Jesus came to them and revealed some new information to them and, and told them what they should do and all this kind of stuff. Like, for instance, an, the angel Moroni came to, um, came to Joseph Smith and said, here's this book, okay? Um, which, on the surface, wouldn't be a bad thing because, I mean, you know, the, the angel, I think it was supposed to be Gabriel, was supposed to be the one that, that revealed the book, the, 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 the Quran, the holy book of Islam, to, um, to Muhammad. Um, which, one could argue, that one could also have been sort of cult-ish. I'm, I'm not calling Muslims or Islam a cult, okay? They are an established religion because they are actually of the Abrahamic religion. They stem from the peoples of Ishmael. Okay, who was of himself a son of Abraham. Okay, so I'm just saying that their tactics and their way that they go about things in certain contexts from the outside looking in could be considered a cult. Now, <clears throat> same thing 
could be said of no, of normal Christianity, right? If you look at it, there's a guy who talks, he gives prophecies, he does certain things, okay? But let us look at an actual cult leader, okay? Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh, he's going to go with Jim Jones. No, I'm not. I'm actually going a little bit newer than that. If you remember back in 1993, there was a standoff, and some of you that watch this channel may or may not remember this, but there was a man by the name of David Koresh, okay? Now, David Koresh was actually born Vernon Wayne Howell in Houston, Texas in 1959, okay, to a 15-year-old single mother. He never knew his father and was raised by his grandparents. In his late-night conversations with FBI agents during the siege, Koresh described his childhood as lonely. He said other kids teased him and called him Vernie. He was dyslexic, a bad student, and dropped out of high school. However, he had musical ability and a strong interest in the Bible. By 12, he had memorized large tracts of it. When he was 20, Koresh turned to the Church of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I'm not calling Seventh-day Adventists cultists, but they do have cults within them, similar to how, like, say, the Westboro Baptist Church is a very cultish wing of the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention has since distanced itself and has, like, said that the Westboro Baptist Church is not part of the Southern Baptist Convention, but their church grew out of the SBC, okay? That's why we, as Christians, are quick, whenever the Westboro Baptist Church comes out and is like, ha, 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 see, da, 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 we're like, no, <laughs> they are not part of us. We do not believe that, <laughs> okay? Um, this is Mother's Church. But he was expelled for being a bad influence on young people. Sometime during the next couple of years, Koresh went to Hollywood, became a rock star, but nothing came of it. Instead, in 1981, he went to Waco, Texas, where he joined the Branch Davidians, a religious sect which in 1935 had settled 10 miles outside of Waco. At one time, it had more than 1,400 members. Koresh had an affair with then-prophetist Lois Roden, who was in her late 60s. The two traveled to Israel together. When Lois Roden died, power struggle between Koresh and Lois Roden's son, George. For a short time, Koresh retreated with his followers to eastern Texas. But in late 1987, he returned to Mount Carmel in camouflage with seven male followers armed with five 223 caliber semi-automatic assault rifles, a.k.a. an AR-15, okay, <clears throat> Um, two twenty-two caliber rifles, two 12-gauge shotguns, and nearly 400 rounds of ammunition. During the gunfight, Roden was shot in the chest and hands. He and his followers went on trial for attempted murder. That's David Koresh. The seven were acquitted, and a mistrial was declared in Koresh's case. Koresh told the jury, jury that he and his men went to Mount Carmel to find evidence of a corpse abuse by Roden, and their shots were aimed at a tree. By 1990, Koresh had become the leader of the Branch Davidians and legally changed his name saying in the court document that his change was, quote, for publicity and business purposes. He said the switch arose from his belief that he was now head of the biblical house of David. Koresh is a Hebrew transliteration of Cyrus, the name of the Persian king who allowed the Jews held captive in Babylon to return to Israel. So he was basically calling himself David Cyrus. Okay? Um, now, <clears throat> on biography.com, so on PBS... That was David Koresh's biography, okay? And that is David Koresh, for those of you that don't know, okay? I remember this very, very vividly because it was something that I was 13 years old at the time when this went down, okay? And I remember the two-week-long siege that happened at the compound because the FBI had heard disturbing information from insiders inside the Branch Davidian compound that there was child abuse, there was sexual abuse, there was um, there was physical and emotional abuse, there was spiritual abuse, there was all types of stuff going on inside of this, and that David Koresh was at the center of it, okay? And before that, nobody had ever really heard of the Branch Davidians, okay? And nobody has ever really heard of them since David Koresh's death in 1993. We'll get to that here in a minute. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, according to Biography.com, okay, Koresh spent much of his lonely childhood playing musical instruments and studying the Bible, which developed into an obsessive interest for Koresh. By age 12, he had memorized and interpreted the entire New Testament. Koresh became a born-again Christian in a Southern Baptist church, but disagreed with their teaching, teachings and joined the Seventh-day Adventist church instead. He was seen as overbearing by congregants, um, constantly attempting to convert them to his interpretations of religion. Koresh was eventually expelled from the church after telling the pastor that God wanted Koresh to take the pastor's 12-year-old daughter as his wife. 
Koresh dropped out of Garland High School in his senior year to take a carpentry job. While in his early 20s, he spent a short time in Los Angeles trying to make it as basically a... Um, uh, well, he was trying to make it as a rock star. Um, in the early 1980s, Koresh, still known as Vernon Howell, moved to Waco, Texas and joined the Branch Davidians. Um, Lois Roden, the widow of Branch Davidians founder Benjamin Roden, encouraged Koresh to play guitar and sing during the group's daily Bible study sessions at the, Mar at the Mount Carmel Center. That's the center that burnt down, by the way. Okay, that was also known as the compound. Okay. Um, in his book, The Devil's Party, Colin Wilson claimed Koresh had an affair with Lois and that Koresh had claimed God had wanted him to father a child with her, whom he said would become the chosen one. Sound familiar? Okay. That's a cult leader. <laughs> okay. He's trying to make himself into God. Okay. 1984, Koresh married a 14-year-old Branch Davidian named Rachel Jones, with whom he would have two children, Cyrus and Starr began teaching his own biblical interpretations in lectures called The Serpent's Root, which caused unrest among the group. A leadership dispute began between Koresh and George Roden, Benjamin's son, who had been expected to take over the sect and clashed with Koresh. The feud reached a boiling point after Roden accused Koresh of setting a fire that destroyed an administration building and press. Koresh claimed the fire was a judgment of God upon the sect. Okay. Roden seemed to win the leadership dispute after he and his supporters drove Koresh out of the Mount Carmel Center at gunpoint. Koresh and his followers resided in eastern Texas for a while, living under difficult conditions. He began recruiting other followers and visited Israel, where he claimed to have a vision revealing he was the modern-day incarnation of the prophet Cyrus who liberated the Jews from Babylon. 1987, Koresh and a handful of his devotees returned to Waco heavily armed. Gunfight broke out, and Rodin was shot but survived the injury. Koresh and his crew were tried for attempted murder, but Koresh received a mistrial, and his followers were acquitted. acquitted. Rodin was later arrested for the 1989 murder of Wayman Dale Eder, whom Roden claimed Koresh had sent to kill him. With Roden out of the way, Koresh was able to reclaim the Mount Carmel Center and become the Branch Davidians' leader. In 1990, he legally changed his name from Vernon Howell to David Koresh. His first new name was a reference to King David, while his last was Cyrus's biblical name. Koresh's teaching included practice of spiritual weddings, which enabled him to bed God-chosen female followers of all ages. Koresh was said to have had as many 20 as 20 wives, um, some of whom were under the age of 17, Texas's legal age of consent and to have fathered at least a dozen children with members other than his legal wife. <clears throat> As leader of the Branch Davidians, Koresh claimed he cracked the code of the seven seals of the Book of Revelation, which predicted the events leading to the Apocalypse. He told his followers that the Lord willed the, D the Davidians to build an army of God. As a result, they started stockpiling weapons. Other Branch Davidians claimed the weapons were not meant for defense, but rather were sold at gun shows to regenerate revenue for the sect. Stockpiling weapons caught the attention of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which obtained a search warrant for Mount Carmel Compound. On February 28, 1993, the ATF attempted to raid the Mount Carmel Center and serve its warrants. A four-hour gunfight erupted that killed six of Koresh's followers and four ATF agents. Koresh himself was shot and injured during the skirmish. Both sides accused the other of having fired the first shots. Now, here's the interesting thing. I actually saw that on the news, um, and I'd, I'd come home from school, and I remember coming in, and my mom was going, did you hear about this? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she flipped on the news, and there was this blue compound building outside of Waco, Texas. And there was, like, vans surrounding it. There's guys with ATF logos. And they say, and she goes, there apparently, like, was these people called the Branch Davidians. They've been stockpiling weapons. The ATF went in there and wanted to serve their warrants. And shots fired and, like, killed some people. And I'm like, what the heck? And, that, and, and, like, we literally stayed glued to the television for the next two weeks. It was crazy. Okay? <clears throat> Following the shootout, the FBI took command and would begin a 51-day siege to the Mount Carmel Center. Agents communicated with Koresh and other cult members inside by telephone. During the first days of the siege, Koresh released some of the children from the compound in exchange for FBI playing recorded messages, messages by Koresh on the radio. At one point, Koresh agreed to surrender himself and allow the rest of his followers to exit the compound peacefully, but he later changed his mind, with one of his followers saying God had told Koresh to wait. According to the FBI, Koresh claimed to be Christ during the negotiations, and he repeatedly went on rambling sermons during their phone calls. He also reportedly used the children inside the Mount Carmel Center as shields, Against the against FBI attempts to resolve the standoff, a total of 35 people were released from the compound during the first half of the siege, including 21 children. Conflicts soon arose with the FBI, with some supporting um, continued negotiations and others advocating for more aggressive action. No other branch Davidians left the center during the second half of the siege. 
So, like, literally, as we sat there and watched the events unfold, because this was like a month and a half, and I remember, like, I paid attention to it for, like, a good week or two during the first half of the siege, and then towards the end of the siege, after, like, the first releases happened, towards the end of the siege, it had kind of become stale. Like, the news weren't really reporting on it, weren't, and then and then all of a sudden... There was this fire that broke out, and it was like it was freaking crazy. And um, and what happened? What what precipitated it was okay. On April nineteenth, nineteen ninety three, the Federal Bureau of Investigation launched a tank and tear gas assault on Mount Carmel. Hours later, fire spread throughout the compound, killing more than six dozen inhabitants. Koresh was among those found dead from an apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Some speculated that the FBI purposely set the fire, but Special Commission later analyzed recordings from FBI microphones that captured Koresh and other Branch Davidians discussing plans to intentionally set the fires themselves. That was a huge sticking point. A lot of people got mad at the FBI and the ATF for how they handled the Branch Davidians. Um... Another reason why the why the FBI got involved wasn't just because of that. Um, so, like, I'll read this um, uh, legacy here in a minute, and then I'll read some quotes from him, okay? And basically, what I want you to take away from this is that at the time of his death, David Koresh wasn't just believing that he was Cyrus reincarnated. He believed he was Christ. Okay? And we'll get into that as we get further into these points. Okay? So, on the legacy of David Koresh. The siege at Waco that ended, Koresh, that ended with Koresh's death has been an enduring fascination among the American public and for decades has continued to inspire anti-government sentiment among the militia movements and far-right organizations. Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols said the Waco incident was a motivating factor in their bombing of federal government building in Oklahoma City in 1995, which killed 168 people and injured hundreds more. The Waco siege has also been the subject of several books, documentaries, and dramatizations over the years. Actor Tim Daly portrayed Koresh in the made-for-television film In the Line of Duty, Ambush at Waco, from 1993. The 2018 television miniseries Waco featured Taylor Kitsch as David Koresh, with a cast that also included Michael Shannon, Andrea Riseborough, Rory Conklin, and Julia Garner. I haven't seen that one. A sequel series called Waco The Aftermath premiered on April 14th, 2023 on Showtime. Waco American Apocalypse, a three-part Netflix docuseries, was released on March 22nd, 2023, marking the 30th anniversary of the deadly siege. Here's some quotes from David Koresh, and then I'll talk, finish up on David Koresh, and then we'll let this guy get into his point. These are some quotes. Quote, So here we are in the day of the Lord. All the prophets talk about the great and dreadful day of the Lord when God will make inquisition for blood. Unquote. Quote, There are some things that God has concealed in his written word that are to be, that are to be brought to do right before the end of time. Unquote. Quote, I'm more willing to come out when I get my message from my commander, meaning God. Unquote. The Bible is true that I'm Christ. What's so great about being Christ? A man nailed to the cross. You know, being Christ ain't nothing. Unquote. Those are some quotes from Tim from from David Koresh. Okay, that's just to kind of show you. Okay, now I saw the Tim Daly made for television movie about Waco in the late '90s because they ran it a few times. Okay, and I happened to just see it. And I happened to watch it because I was fascinated by it. I was kind of like, wow, you know, this was an event. It's kind of like Columbine. It was uh, it was an event that happened during my lifetime. Um, I was young and impressionable then. wasn't um, I, I wasn't a strong Christian at the time it happened, so I didn't really understand what he was all about. I think when I saw the movie, I was either a brand new Christian or I was on the cusp of being a Christian. So it was kind of fascinating to actually watch a uh, false Christ being portrayed because he absolutely did believe himself to be Christ. Um, when I said that he had abused a lot of his people mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, I don't mean that in a hyperbole. That actually happened. Um, the movie went into great detail about what he was doing, okay? And when he invited all of his members out to the compound, one of the things that he demanded from his male members was that at any time, if, if, if he wanted to sleep 
with their wives, because they were married to those wives. If David Koresh wanted to sleep with those wives, they had no choice but to just say, okay, here you go, okay? And he also was like, for a period of days leading up to a point where he wanted to sleep with them, like, they couldn't have sex. Like, they had to be celibate, okay? And then for like, you know, if they got pregnant from him, then, then that man couldn't have sex with his wife until after the child was born. It was a horrible situation, okay? The thing about it is, is that David Koresh himself, like Jim Jones, okay, was a fanatic who believed himself to be more than what he actually was, okay? He was a sinful human being. He was not a god. He was not a messiah. He was not anything but just a, an absolute jerk of a man, okay, who used his position to just get whatever he wanted, okay? And that's part of the reason that it fascinates people so much is because, I mean, the same thing happened when Jim Jones did what he did, okay? That's where the, that's where the phrase drink the Kool-Aid came from is because um, Jim Jones and, and also the guy's during the, the hale Bop incident, when, when Comet hale Bop came, a whole bunch of people drank a bunch of poison Kool-Aid and died. Um, but the, the reason why we use the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid, is because of Jim Jones. Okay? That's where that phrase comes from. Okay? Because he basically, he had garnered a whole bunch of followers. Okay? They tried living in various compounds across the United States. Every time they went in, members would sneak out messages to their loved ones, to their to their friends, to their family. And this is what happened with David Koresh, and I'll get back to that in a second. But basically, um, they would get messages out, and then people would try to come and try to get. In fact, there is... Um, uh, In the first season of the original A-Team, um, John Saxon plays a member of um, a religious cult similar to Jim Jones, okay? Where he believes himself to be the spokesman of God, and he's doing all of this stuff. And it was directly, like it was three years after the Jim Jones incident. Literally, this, this, this show came out in 1982, and Jim Jones... And his followers committed suicide in 1979. So, literally, it was right on the back of that. Okay? And anytime you have this sort of religious extremist, you have this religious nut who goes crazy and kills a bunch of his followers, it permeates the popular culture for a while. Okay? And we saw this happen in the 90s after David Koresh. We saw a lot of things happen where people were like, whoa, what was this? What did that... What? How did this go? Why did this happen? You know, because a lot of people were asking questions. And of course, whenever the government is involved, people are quick to lay blame, okay, at the government's feet. Oh, the FBI didn't do it right. Did they? We'll never know, okay? Um, I'm inclined to think that because <clears throat> a few years after, after they'd done a forensic analysis of the wreckage of the house, after they had analyzed a lot of the um, radio recordings of the Branch Davidians talking to one another, they released a full unredacted um, uh, thing. And then after FOIA was made, um, more requests were made to the FBI to release unredacted versions of what happened in Waco. So we have a pretty good idea of what actually happened there. Okay, so it's not like we're sitting here in the dark going, oh, the FBI just screwed up. No, we know that the Branch Davidians most likely set the fires, even though there was incendiary tear gas used. Incendiary tear gas is literally just, it's a cartridge that's inside, and what they do is, is they, um, it, it, it's basically, it looks like a frag grenade, okay, like what you would normally see. It's like a, it's a metal canister, okay? And on the inside is another canister 
that has the tear gas inside. And then what it does is, is when you throw it in, okay, um, a charge goes off and it basically blows the metal can off and breaks the tube inside that has the tear gas in it and that's what releases the tear gas okay um could those have actually landed on some of the piles that they were talking about and incidentally started fires maybe here again we don't know okay um but getting back to what i was saying before okay jim jones went to africa okay and some un delegates and some american delegates came to inspect the compound and jim jones got super paranoid figured the end is here and so he basically had them spike kool-aid okay literally kool-aid because they had women and children there and then he had them all drink it and then they died okay and and this is why i was talking before about you know about the members of the actual compound getting messages out usually in these cults when people are inside of the cult the cult leaders generally make it insular so you can't get messages out that's actually one of the central themes of this episode let me grab this really fast <clears throat> um it's called the children of jamestown and um, it says, after the A-Team rescues a girl from a crazed cult leader, they are captured by the man's followers and made um, the quarry for um, of a death hunt. And so basically what ends up happening is, is that in the show, this gal is, her father is like, my daughter joined this, like, joined this cult and I haven't heard from her since. And so the A-Team go in and they hatch a little plan and they get her out. And then Murdoch basically, like, you know, gets her in the in the helicopter, and he flies, and he f flies her and her father out, and she's like, "Oh, Daddy, you wouldn't believe what they've been doing to us." And he's like, "I know, it's all over now, honey." Um, that's also what happened, um, because not only were they stockpiling weapons, well, guns, firearms, but there were also messages being transmitted to people's families in in in, in, in intermittently okay um where people were getting messages out saying help us help us and without anybody to turn to because they couldn't turn to local law enforcement they basically handed all of these messages over to the fbi and that's one of the reasons why the fbi showed up as the atf was trying to serve their warrant and some shots were fired the fbi was coming to actually try to talk to um, to David Koresh. And that's actually in the Tim Daly um, movie, was some of the women that were in there that, that survived, that were released during the, um, during the siege, okay, they actually, like, were interviewed later on, and they said, you know, here's what happened, here's what, you know, here's what he did. You know, I was trying to get messages out to my family, I was trying to do this, I was trying to do that. And that was one of the reasons why the FBI got involved is because the FBI came in and like they had hostage negotiators who came in and basically like talked to them and were like, hey, we want to make sure that you guys are doing the right thing. OK, so that's basically what, you know, cult leaders do. OK, is they try to bring people in and they try to suck them into this world of fantasy and falsehoods so that they can get what they want. Jesus never did that. And we'll get into that as we get into the points. So let's jump into his points. He's going to go over his first five points fairly quickly, and then we'll discuss those five points, and we'll continue moving on. I'll save the best for last, so please stay tuned to the end. Number one, the worship of a single charismatic individual as the central focus of the group. Number two, the group stands or falls based on whether the leader is who he says he is. Number three, authoritarian leadership that can never be questioned. Number four, the leader claiming to be divine or to have special authority from God over other people. Number five, that everyone is required to follow them or else be doomed. Number. Okay, 
So, <clears throat> the worship of a single charismatic individual is a central focus of the group. Okay? Well, then, here again, you'd have to call Buddhism a cult. You'd have to call Hinduism a cult. You'd have to call Islam a cult. You'd have to call pretty much every religion on the planet a cult. Because that's basically every religion on the planet, dude. Okay? It's... Because, I mean, like, like Mormonism, right? Joseph Smith. He was a very charismatic person who wandered around and said, Look, I have this book. I have this revel new revelation from God. It was given to me by an angel. And people followed him. He was a charismatic individual. David Koresh, very charismatic individual. People followed him. Jim Jones, same thing. Okay? The, the thing is, is that it's what is that single charismatic individual doing? Are they doing it for themselves or are they doing it for others? Because Jesus wasn't just solely focused on himself. Okay? Like, you know, like Joseph Smith, like David Koresh, like Jim Jones, like a lot of these, you know, um, prosperity gospel preachers. Catherine Crick is another good example. Um, she's a very charismatic leader, and people are following her just like they follow David Koresh. I mean, she's a cult leader in the making, folks. Like, right now, today, she is literally doing the exact same thing that Jim Jones and David Koresh did. Okay? And I would even argue that people like Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes and Stephen Furtick and Michael Todd and Todd White and Benny Hinn and um, Kenneth Copeland and all of these prosperity gospel pastors out there, they're modern-day cult leaders because they're telling everybody what they want to hear. They're very charismatic. Okay? They get people all interested in what they're talking about. Woo! Some of them start out as very biblical. Okay? I mean... Hell, David Koresh, at the age of 12, had memorized most of the New Testament. Bully on him. But just because you know something doesn't mean that you are that. Okay? <coughs> now, number two. This goes back to his introduction, okay? Where he says, The group stands or falls based on whether the leader is who he says he is. Okay? <clears throat> Let me grab... Let me grab my Bible. Go to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 5. Okay? This is... Okay, so basically, okay, um, after Ananias and Sapphira, okay, lied to the disciples and died in Acts, in the beginning of Acts chapter 5, okay, um, the apostles go... Um, to the portico of Solomon. This was a this was a portion of the temple that was in between the general area where women and men could hang out, and the place where men only could hang out, where the sacrifices were made. Okay, because back then the temple of the Jews was split into three parts. Okay, there was the colonnade, which was where everybody could gather. Okay, that was kind of the outer temple courtyard. There was the inner temple courtyard where only men were allowed. That's where animals were sold. That's where Jesus overturned the money, the money tables, whipped the whipped the um, things out, and did all that stuff because the men had to go in and offer the sacrifices for their families. And then there was the inner temple, which contained the sacrificial altar, and then the holy of holies. The holy of holies was where the the priest would consecrate himself and then enter once a year to make a sacrifice to God for the people. You can read about that in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Leviticus. Okay, um, Aaron was given that um, as a uh, as a thing. Okay, interesting note. Okay, <clears throat> so basically those guys are at the portico of Solomon. So that's this was the actual like dividing line between where the general populace could be 
okay, men and women, and where the men could congregate in the inner courtyard, okay? And it says, um, no one else ever dared to join them, but the people were loud in their praise, and the numbers of men and women who came to believe in the Lord increased steadily. Um, so many signs and wonders were worked among the people at the hands of the apostles that the sick were even um, taken out to the streets and laid on beds and sleeping mats in hopes that at least the shadow of Peter might fall across some of them as he went. Um, people even came crowding in from towns um, around, around Jerusalem, bringing with them their sick and those tormented by unclean spirits. All of them were cured. And that says, then the high priest intervened with all of his supporters from the party of the Sadducees. Now, it's, it's important to note, okay, there was two sects back then that were part of the sort of um, pharisaical, I guess you could call it sort of the pharisaical or the priestly order of the Jews back then. There was the Pharisees, which were more the conservative people, and then there was the Sadducees, which were more liberal. The Pharisees, which is what Ananias was, okay, he was part of the Pharisees, and Nicodemus, okay, actually Paul was a Pharisee as well, Gamaliel was a Pharisee. These were people that believed in the miracles of the Old Testament, they, they you know, they studied the scriptures, they, they believed in spiritual warfare, all that kind of stuff. The Sadducees were more naturalist. They were more liberal. They were more miracles don't happen. You know, this is stupid. Um, so the Sadducees, <clears throat> in the time <clears throat> between Ananias killing Jesus, okay, um, under Pontius Pilate, and the anointing of the people at, um, at Pentecost, which happened 50 days after Passover, there was a change in leadership. The Pharisees lost their power. Ananias was removed as high priest, and a new high priest was appointed. Okay. <clears throat> From the Sadducees. Prompted by jealousy, they arrested the apostles and had them put in a common jail. But at night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison gates and said, as he led them out, Go and stand in the temple and tell the people about this new life. And they did as they were told, and they went into the temple at dawn and began to preach. Um, so then, basically, um, the Sanhedrin, which was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribe, you know, the chief, they call it like the chief priests and the scribes of the, of the law and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is sort of the, the council of Israel. It's called the Sanhedrin, okay? There was, and at the time, they didn't hold much power because the Roman prefect, the governor at this time was Pont still Pontius Pilate, okay? Um, was there, and he was the one that kind of, like, ran everything, okay? Um, but the Senate could still do things, okay? The, this supposed Senate in Israel, um, Joseph of Arimathea was a part of it, um, John had been a part of it at one point, um, that was why he was allowed in in the book of John, that's why he was allowed into the courtyard, in fact, he was the one that got Peter into the courtyard during Jesus' trial. Um, so, there were some people that were part of this council, okay, um, that are mentioned in the Gospels <clears throat> and the book of Acts, okay. Um, so then, so then they, so this council goes, okay, well, get those, get those apostles and bring them over here. So the guards go and they open up the jail cell and they're like, wait a minute, they're not here. So they find them out in the temple, okay, um, and then they come in and they, uh, at this very moment, the men you imprisoned are in the temple. They are standing there preaching to the people. The captain went with his men and fetched them. They were afraid to use force in case the people stoned them. Okay, When they brought them face to face at the Sanhedrin, they said, We give you a formal warning not to preach in, his, in this name. What have you done? You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and seem determined to fix the guilt of this man's death on us. In reply, Peter and the apostles said, Obedience to God comes before obedience to men. It was the God of our ancestors who raised up Jesus, but it was you who had him executed by hanging on a tree. By his own right hand, God has now raised him up to be leader and savior, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins through him to Israel. <coughs> we are witnesses to all of this. We and the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This so infuriated them that they wanted to put them to death. Now, this is where a man named Gamaliel comes in. And forgive me, because I spent so much time talking about what a true cult leader is, this video is probably going to go a little bit longer than I, than I should want. 
and this might be a three-part video, I might end this right at about an hour and then continue on. <clears throat> but Gamaliel was the teacher of Saul, later known as Paul. Okay. Saul was his Jewish name, Paul was his Roman name, because he was born in Tarsus, which was actually a Roman province. Okay. His mother sent him to Jerusalem to learn about the the Jewish faith from the Jews. Okay. Um, because if you weren't a part of Israel, you were an outsider. Okay, you were a Gentile. Even if you were a Jew, you were considered a Gentile. Because you didn't typically speak Hebrew. You spoke Greek. Okay? Because that was the language that was spoken at the time. And so Gamaliel basically taught Saul, okay, showed him, here's how you're going to do things, here's how you're going to do stuff, here's what you're going to do, here's how this is going to work, blah 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 blah. Okay, and taught him the Old Testament, taught him the Septuagint. Okay, so he studied Aramaic, he studied Greek, okay, and that's one of the reasons why in chapter 9, okay, Jesus says, you're my chosen instrument. Why? Because he knew Aramaic, he knew Greek, and he knew the Old Testament, and Jesus knew that, okay, and if you'd watched my Christy Burke debunk, um, you can find it on my channel, okay, um, the, the, um, uh, I think it's, uh, Seven times Paul contradicts Jesus um, debunk. Okay, um, you'll know that because I talk extensively in there about Acts chapter nine. Okay, like what he did. So let's let's talk about Gamaliel here. Okay, <clears throat> one member of the Sanhedrin, however, was a Pharisee called Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law and respected by the whole people. Stood up and asked to have the men taken outside for a time. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, be careful how you deal with these people. There was Theudas, who became notorious not so long ago. He claimed to be someone important, and he even collected about 400 followers. But when he was killed, all his followers scattered, and that was the end of them. And then there was Jud Judas of the Galilean, at the time of the census, who attracted crowds of supporters, but he got killed too, and all of his followers dispersed. What I suggest, therefore, is that you leave these men alone and let them go. If this enterprise, this movement of theirs, is of human origin, it will break up of its own accord. But if it does not, or if it does, in fact, sorry, not does not, but if it does, in fact, come from God, you will not only be unable to destroy them, but you might find yourselves fighting against God. His advice was accepted, and they had the apostles called in, gave orders for them to be flogged, warned them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and released them. And so they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, glad to have the honor of suffering humiliation for the sake of the name. They preached every day, both in the temple and in private houses, and their proclamation of the good news of Christ Jesus was never interrupted. Now, <clears throat> Flavius Josephus, okay, was a Roman historian who wrote a series of books about the Jews at the behest of Caesar, okay? And this was sometime after he went down into Israel and he talked with members of the Sanhedrin, he talked with, you know, different people, and he learned about their culture, he learned about the Old Testament, and he wrote down an entire history um, he called. He had like wars of. He had. He had wars. He had antiquities. He had various different things. Okay. And in um, book twenty, section ninety-seven of antiquities, he mentions Theudas. Okay, who had around about four hundred followers, and within about six months of of Theudas's death, okay, he was a zealot. Okay, he was a rebel against Rome. Within about six months of his death, his 400 followers had all but disappeared. How long has it been since Jesus died? Oh, that's right, 2,000 years now. Yeah, not thinking this is of men there, dude. Okay? Now, in Antiquities 18, sections 1 and 6, um, he does mention um, Judas... The Galilean. But there's a different book called Battles, I think. 
battles or wars, one of the two. I'll have a link in the description about that. Um, I'll have a, I'll have a couple links um, that will talk about this from Joseph, you know, because people talk about this, okay, um, from different sources of Josephus talking about Judas the Galilean. Um, because Judas the Galilean, okay, claimed to be a Messiah. He did. And he gathered a whole bunch of followers. He ran around the countryside, did a whole bunch of things, harassed the Romans. He ended up dead. All of his followers dispersed. And as Gamaliel says, if this was of, you know, the if this was of men, it will dissipate. If it's of God, then you'll just only end up fighting God. Okay? And so, this is where we as Christians can sit down and say, okay, here's Judas the Galilean, okay? Here's Theudas, and here's Jesus. And all three of these are mentioned by Josephus. They're also mentioned in the Bible, and only one of them has endured to this day. Any guess as to which one? Now, let me ask you another question. Okay? I'm going to ask it of this guy. I'm also going to ask it of you. And I'd love for you to throw down a comment. How many followers of David Koresh are there still? How many followers of Jim Jones? Oh. Seems like this isn't of men. It seems divine in origin. Okay? Because Jesus just wasn't claiming to be divine. When he died, he actually rose again. And if the followers had somehow lied about his his ascension, eventually it would have come out. There would have been some kind of thing where people would have come out and said, you know what, guys? Yeah, we hid the body. We can't lie anymore. Or somebody would have stumbled across the body at some point. And they would have recognized it as the broken, battered, bloodied corpse of Jesus. And they would have been like, you know, with a hole in his side and a crown of thorns on his head. And they would have been like, yeah, this is this is the body of Jesus. And it would have been a huge thing. And this whole thing would have crumbled like a house of cards. But here we are, 2,000 years later, still worshiping Jesus. seems to me like there's more to it okay and for more on this okay I recommend especially if you're a Christian and even if you're not because this guy wasn't when he started this journey read Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict okay this book is excellent it has a lot of really good um, stuff in it okay about Jesus and why we are still worshiping him today because Josh McDowell was an atheist Okay, he used to walk around at his campus, and he would see Christians doing Bible studies at his co college, you know, kind of HUD building, kind of hub building. And one day he was scoffing at him, and and the leader said, "Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, if you think that it's false, go prove it wrong." Josh McDowell was like, "All right, now fine, I'll prove it wrong." Not only did he end up proving it right, but he ended up becoming a Christian in the process. Okay. Because the more he looked at the evidence, the more he realized that there was way more to this than just some fancy book of tales that that the atheists try to make the Bible out as. Okay. Now, his third point is, he says, authoritarian leadership that can never be questioned. And this is why, this is one of the reasons why I think this guy was a Catholic. Okay. Now, for those of you that don't know, I went to Catholic private school for four years, a little over four years, because I came in kind of around about March, April time frame um, of the school year in second grade, okay? Um, finished out my second grade year and then did all of third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade, okay? So I was there for about five years, okay? And 
so I got super immersed into the Catholic religion. Okay, I wasn't the only one, because there were a lot of non-Catholics that were a part of the school. I mean, yes, the majority of the student body was Catholic, but there were a lot like me who were Protestants who were there because they their parents had put them there for the education, not necessarily because they wanted their kids to be Catholic. <laughs> we were not allowed to participate in certain things. Like when I first got there, I was given a book labeled The Eucharist for non-Catholics. <laughs> it was a little gold book. I don't have it anymore. But you open it up and you read through it and it would tell you what the Catholics believe about communion. Because <clears throat> the Catholics at that time, um, and I still believe they do it today, um, basically from the time they're in preschool all the way through second grade, they go to these classes if they're not already in um, Catholic private school. They go through these classes and they learn about communion. They learn about the Bible. They learn about Jesus. They learn about all this stuff. And then when they get towards the end of second grade, okay, if they've passed this class or if they're in the, the school and they, they pass their religion class that year, um, they get to go up and they get to take their first communion. And it is a huge deal. Like all the parents show up. They're taking pictures. I remember it clearly because my buddy um, and like all of all of his family members, all of their family, you know, all the people were up there and they were taking pictures and they were doing all this stuff because it was their first communion. Okay. Um, and the Catholic Church does have an authoritarian leadership sect that cannot be questioned. You can't question your priests, you can't question the bishops, you can't question the cardinals, and you can't question the pope or monsignors. Um, and so there's a lot of hierarchy there. Okay. Um, there's also a lot of like rituals, and we'll get into that later on in the video, but basically there's a lot of ritualistic things. Probably one of the most famous ones. You've probably seen this in movies. You've probably seen this in sporting events. You've probably seen this with people doing things on stage. It's called the sign of the cross. Okay, What it is, is you touch your forehead. That's the Father. You touch down. Sometimes they touch here. Sometimes they touch. You're supposed to touch down by your belly button. Okay, So you're supposed to go Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? And so you'll see people do that, okay? Um, like if you saw the movie Sister Act with Whoopi Goldberg and Dame Maggie Smith, same thing, okay? <laughs> the the women all there, Catholics, okay? They they do the sign of the cross. Um, the uh, um, if you've seen the movie Doubt with um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and um, Meryl Streep. Same thing. They all make the sign of the cross. Okay. Um, you'll predominantly see it among, like if you watch <coughs> baseball, you'll predominantly see it amongst the Hispanic players, usually. They will do the sign of the cross either before they go up to bat or maybe if they hit a home run, you know, they'll, they'll do the sign of the cross and then, they'll, and then, you know, they'll kind of put their hands up or whatever, you know, or they'll point up at God or whatever. Okay. Um, because... Like, that's the main religion of Mexico is Catholicism, okay? Um, so that's what they do. They're just, that's ingrained into their behaviors, okay? Um, and I'm pretty sure that that's one of the reasons as we get further and further into this is probably one of the reasons why this guy is not a Catholic anymore, is not even a Christian anymore, is because he probably had a lot of questions for the priests, for the people, for his family members. And they were probably like, you can't ask questions, blah, blah, blah. As I've said on my channel many times before, it is okay to ask questions. It is okay to have doubts, okay, about your faith. But what you can't do is make spurious claims like this and expect everybody to take you seriously, okay? Now, number four, um, the leader claiming to be divine or to have special authority from God over other people. My biggest caveat to that is 
it depends on how they use this authority. Okay? Are they using it for personal gain? Or are they using it to absolutely help others? And I would say that if you contrast David Koresh with the actual Jesus, okay? David Koresh, and you could argue Jim Jones and a lot of other false preachers and false apostles and false Christs, use their power for their own selfish ends, okay? David Koresh was using it so that he could have sex with as many women as he wanted to. And when the people didn't want him to do it, he would, he would abuse them in certain ways. To get them to understand that he was in charge and that he was in that he, I am Jesus, ha ha ha. It's a very selfish thing to do. Jesus was not a selfish person, okay? Jesus used his power to help others, okay? He was constantly giving away to the poor. He was constantly preaching to people. He was constantly feeding the masses. And he was constantly doing some things. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit later detail, okay? Him, you know, because this guy's going to talk about, you know, going after the marginalized and all this other garbage. That's a whole other issue, and we'll get into that later. But basically, it depends on how they use their authority. Jesus was never here, like, telling people, like, putting a sword to their throat and saying, Believe in me or die! No. I mean, in fact, Jesus went so far as to multiple times in the Gospels say, You know, not everyone's going to believe in me. Not everyone's going to have this, this you know... Not everyone's going to understand this message. Not everyone's going to believe in me. Um, in fact, probably one of the... Um, let me see here. I'll go into... I think it's Matthew chapter... I mean, sorry, John chapter 6. Um, where... Let me start in verse 59, okay? So this is the bread of life discourse. So this is where Jesus is like, I am the bread of life. Because the people come in and he's like, you guys were looking for me only because you had your fill of bread and you're just looking for more physical bread. I'm here going to give you spiritual bread, the bread of life, okay? Saying, I am the bread of life. And towards the end of that, okay, says, he taught this doctrine at Capernaum in the synagogue. After hearing it, many of his followers said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? Jesus, aware that his followers were complaining about it, and said, does this upset you? What, what if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the outset those who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. He went on, This is why I told you that no one could come to me unless the Father allows him. After this, many of his disciples left him and stopped going with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, What about you? Do you want to go away too? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life, and we believe. We know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, you twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, since this was the man, one of the twelve, who was going to betray him. Um, there is another one in Matthew. It was... Let me see here. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me get there really quick. Let me get there really quick. <sighs> My problem is, I know what it is. <laughs> I just can never remember the exact one. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, Matthew 10, 34 through 36. Um, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. Anyone whose father or mother who prefers father or mother to me is not worthy of me. Anyone who prefers son or daughter, this is 37 through four, 39. Okay. 
Anyone who prefers son or daughter to me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow in my footsteps is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it, and anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. So basically, Jesus is talking about that we as Christians, if we... And this guy's going to get into this a little bit later on in this video, too, um, because he's going to misread this whole entire thing. But basically, Jesus knew that his words were going to create division. Okay? And he's saying, look, you're going to be following... He goes, and this was not just for the people of that time. This was for people of all time because it's in the... Um, it's in the future perfect tense, okay? He says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. Okay? It's it's saying, it doesn't matter who hears my words. It's going to cause division. Okay? That's what he's talking about when he says, I have come to bring, I'm not come to bring peace, but a sword. Is he saying this sword is to make sure that people understand that my teaching is not just for itching ears. My teaching is absolutely going to bring division. Okay? And there are other passages in the text that talk about that. Okay? Now, <laughs> number five kind of ties into number four. Okay? where he says that everyone is required to follow them or else be doomed. Well, let's go back to the book of John really fast. Okay. Because it seems like this guy doesn't know this passage at all. Okay. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned, but whoever refuses to believe in him is condemned already, because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only son. What is Jesus talking about there? <coughs> That's John 3, 16 through 18. What is he talking about there? Jesus is telling Nicodemus, okay, which the Jews have been waiting for the Messiah for a long time, okay? Ever since Abraham, okay? Because Jesus says it in, um, in, I think it's John 7, um, or John 8, where he's like, before Abraham was, I am, okay? He says, Abraham longed to see this day. Talking about Jesus there, right then, okay? So the Jews have been waiting since Abraham for this promised Messiah. Here comes Jesus. And Nicodemus is like, tell me plainly, who are you? And Jesus lays it out for him, who he is. And in the middle of that passage, he basically tells him, yes, God so love the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The world stands condemned of sin. Jesus is not saying, believe in me or die. Okay? That's what actual cult leaders do. In fact, no offense to my Islam fans out there or anybody who practices Islam, but that's kind of what Muhammad preached. Believe in Allah. Take the Shahada or die right now. There are people in Muslim countries who are Christian, okay, who, when they're found out, are either shunned by their parents, gee, Jesus said that would happen, or be outright killed for their faith. Because the people will say to them, you know, 
take the Shahada, be a Muslim again, or die. There are Christians in China right now that are being martyred for their faith. What do you say to them? Mr. Deconstruction Zone over here. What do you say to them? Hmm? What do you say to them? That they should renounce Jesus and just follow the world because, you know, then, then they get to keep their measly life here on earth? Why? A much better reward awaits them in heaven. Why would you not want to die for your faith? Son, this is not a doomsday prophecy here. This is not a believe or die, okay? This is, we are condemned in the world because the world is sinful. The law, okay? The law of Moses says we are condemned. We are condemned of sin. Why? Genesis chapter 3, okay? Original sin. We are sinners. We are all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'm sorry if I can't believe in this kind of idiocy where you're going to stand there to say everyone is required to follow them or else be doomed. Dude, you're required to believe whatever you want to believe. You have free will, don't you? No one's holding a gun to your head. No one's slapping you with the Bible going, Believe or die, believe or die, believe or die. Son, wake up! We're not, we're not telling you you have to believe or else you're doomed. No, we're saying if you don't believe, that's the fate that awaits you. If you want to go there, go right ahead. We're not going to stop you. Okay? <laughs> we're not. If you want to do that, go right ahead. No one's stopping you. Okay? The Lord is not being slow to carry out his promises as anyone as anybody else might be called slow. But he is being patient with you all, wanting nobody to be lost and everybody to be brought to, a change his, to change his ways. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then it will roar in the sky, and, and with a roar will sky in, in the sky will vanish. The elements will catch fire and fall apart, and the earth and all that it contains will be burned up. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, 9 and 10. Son, the day of the Lord is coming. Okay? And we'll get into that. Okay? On the next one. Alright? We'll get into that. So smash that like button. Hit subscribe. Drop a comment below. Let me know what you think of this series. And as we say, we will see you on the next one.